Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it's time for reading the scripture. Please stand for the reading of God's word. <coughs> Today we are reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For when you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life which you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of, in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but in Christ, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you all. So, so good to worship with you guys today. God's presence is indeed here. And I'm so grateful to that. I imagine that most of you know that Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, right? By the blank looks, did you know that this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday? It starts. Ash Wednesday, if you don't know, begins officially the journey to Easter. From this point, it's approximately six weeks until Easter Sunday, and we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Easter, this season we're getting ready to enter into, is the Christian's season. This is unique to who we are. This is the, the heartbeat of the Christian faith. This should be the most exciting time of the year. Amen. And yet, the anticipation and build-up to Easter is so unlike Christmas, isn't it? I wonder whose fault that is. I mean, we can blame the media and commercialization, and it's us. We, us, Christians, we're to blame. I, I mean, if we're honest, no, I mean strip away all the excuses and, and look it straight in the eye honest. Do you know what I'm talking about? We just aren't that excited about the resurrection and all Jesus has done for us. Now, pastor, you're starting to meddle. I mean, pastor, we love Jesus. I mean, we come to church week after week. We, we sing and we pray and we give and we work and... and, and let me ask you a question. What if we were just a fraction as excited about a relationship with Jesus as we are about football or our hobbies or our kids' sports? So, okay, we get it. Ouch, ouch. Maybe there's an amen in there too. You see, on Ash Wednesday, many people, primarily those of the Roman Catholic faith, will go to a service and a pastor or a priest will put a smear of ashes on their forehead and often it will be in the sign of a cross. For them, it is a once-a-year acknowledgement that they are choosing to follow Jesus. That they recognize that, that we're on the, officially on the journey to the cross and they're willing to enter into six weeks of intentional spiritual discipline and even self-denial. I, I mean, you have heard about giving up things for Lent, right? That's where it comes from. For many, the idea of intentionally focusing on the spiritual journey for six weeks seems generous. 
will say things like this. Oh, won't God be pleased with me? I'm giving him six weeks. Yay, God. Yay, me. I, I mean, I give up chocolate for six weeks. What a sacrifice. Folks, personally, I'm, I choose to give up tomatoes. And beets. <laughs> now, if I gave up french fries, that would be a sacrifice. You're right. You're right. But isn't it amazing how often we decide what is generous to give to God? How our choice of what we give, how much we give, and how long we do it is somehow sacrificial. Hmm. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about love and, and how often we show love to other people in ways that they don't appreciate or don't even understand. Because you see, what I appreciate uh, um, is, as an expression of love may not be that loving to you. You know, you've all heard of love languages, right? We want to show expressions of love to each other in ways that we understand. So it stands to reason that we need to do what God thinks is Oh, we're not talking about dollars and cents. We're talking about life choices and an intentional attitude of, here I am, Lord. Make me, use me, whatever way you see fit. Do you want to know what God's love language is? Obedience. We understand love, but you know the way that God knows that we love him? The, the, the best way that we can show God we love him? Obey him. Let me give you a hint, kids. One of the best ways you can show your parents that you love them is obedience. We're not saying that is love. We're saying that's an expression of love. That's a way to show that we love. I wondered if you, do you think that if we would live a more focused Christian life, if we walked around with the sign of the cross smeared on our foreheads all the time? There's a quote that I read that gave me the title for today's sermon. It said, our churches are filled with knowledgeable, disobedient Christians. I want you to know as I read through that, it pierced my heart. Could it be true? We know the truth, but how often do we know and then don't do it? Another amen or ouch, right? Hmm. Huh. We've all heard this before, but are we hearers of the word only and not doers? People, there is no sacred and secular when it comes to our lives. We either belong to Christ and live in the sacred or we are split personalities. We're living in obedience only when it's convenient and we choose to do it. You see, this is the true mark of a Christian, living in obedience now, I'm not talking about living legalistically. It's about living in grace, receiving it, and, and hear me, here's the part where we fail a lot, dispensing it. I'm really good at receiving grace, folks, because I desperately need it. But I have to be careful. Sometimes I'm not so good at dispensing grace to other people. Well, I'm reading through the book of Colossians right now, and the passage read, I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. This is stuck with me. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So I don't have a PowerPoint, but if you want to follow along with your notes, it's there on the back of your bulletin. I have some questions. <clears throat> the first one is this. The first question is letting go. I, I've been pondering some questions ago with that. Okay, when we're letting go of stuff, what does it mean to let go? I mean, to really let go. When is it good to let go? What is it good to let go of? And maybe it's not so good to let go of some things. You, you see, sometimes we need to let go of something so that there is room for something else in our lives. That's the purpose of fasting and self-denial. That's in Lent. That's what it's all about. The idea is letting go of something for a season so there's room for something else. 
We let go of something for a time so that we have the time and resources for something deeper and better. The hope is that new habits will be developed and the unhelpful and unnecessary will be let go of permanently. But in verse 5 in our passage of Scripture today, Paul makes it even stronger. He says it this way, put to death. That takes it to a whole other level, doesn't it? I mean, we can let go of something, but we know it's still there. You know, we can pick it up later if we want to. I'm not being morbid, guys, but, but you know, when it means put to death, you know what that means? It's gone. It's not there anymore. You can't, you can't pick it up anymore. You, you Put to death. So that brings me to the second question. Really, letting go of what? So back to the things that, we, that are good to let go of. Not all are bad things. Some are just not necessary. You know what the enemy of the best is? The good. A lot of people say, well, that's good. But the enemy of the best is good because when we settle for good, we miss the best. But here Paul gives a clear recital of things to let go of. I'm not going to quote him again, but whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he lists it out here. And and most people would say, check, done, let go of that stuff. Because there's some stuff in there that really needs to be let go of, right? Did, Did you read it? Did you hear it? Let me just remind us. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And I'm happy to say that most of us are going to say, yes, done, did it. Let that stuff go. But then Paul starts to meddle. Don't you love it when he does that? See, this isn't me. This is Paul, okay? This is Paul. He says, but now implying that some of these things might still be troublesome for the Christian. He already said, okay, the earthly nature stuff, you let that go. But now these, anger, rage, malice, slander. You know, let's just call it what it is, gossip. You you know what slander is or gossip? It's talking behind someone's back and not talking to them. It's cutting someone down behind their back when they don't know about it to somebody else who probably has no business hearing about it. Slander, Hmm. filthy language, lying, division. Those are things to let go of. Well, how how do I do that? You know, I'm glad you asked. As we move through this Lenten season, there are some, some disciplines that we can work on that might help us. Let me just list some of these spiritual disciplines. One of them is silence. I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But prayer, fasting, solitude, reading Scripture. Not just reading Scripture, but listening. You know, there's a difference between just taking the Bible and reading through it. And, but read through it with an ear saying, okay, God, what would you say to me through this passage of Scripture? It's a discipline. It's work. It, it's harder to do it that way. Sometimes I take a notebook. Or if I'm at the computer, you can type if you're fast. But I generally use pen and paper. And just read the scripture and say, okay, God, what would you say to me through this? Worship is another one of those things that we can can be a discipline that we need to work on. Because, I mean, I I wonder how often we come to worship God and we don't worship God at all. Right? We can all be guilty. We can just go through the motions without really worshiping him. Reflection, service, meditation are some of those disciplines. But to have time... For, for one or more of these disciplines, something will have to go. Here, here's a, ta- a thought, and I'm going to really meddle for a minute right now. How about fasting immediacy? Do you know what I mean by immediacy? I, here, let me go further. Are you a news junkie? You don't have to. This is not true confession time, but some of us are. Are you a news junkie? Do you read the newspaper over coffee, then turn on the radio as you drive and you check websites and then, and then you watch those shows on TV, the news shows? Are, are you a news junkie? If you're not, it's okay. But you may be another kind of information or media junkie, right? For some people, focusing and staying in touch up to the minute adds to the sense of frantic activity that can deplete your spirit. Try an experiment for a week. Total news blackout. Oh, my goodness. No newspapers, no radio, no TV news shows. 
Let, let me tell you something. If something really important happens that you need to know about, someone will tell you. They will. Spend time consciously slowing your life down. Turn off the junk and listen. And listen. Hmm. See, the goal is to let go. I don't know about you, but letting go is hard. There are same things that I just do by habit. I come in and I turn on the news. I just want to see what happened in the last five minutes. See, it may not, be, may, not, may not be news. It may be you insert the blank, whatever it is. What would happen if you let go of it for a week? Just a week. Just try it for a week. Some people have let go of TV and they've never got it back. They're braver than I. You see, I like my stuff. I, I don't want people to move my cheese or upset my apple cart. I am more than willing to have God work in my life. I just don't want him to change anything. So the next question follows from this. Letting go of what to making room. You see, as I mentioned, the purpose of letting go isn't just to let go, but it's, it's not for letting go's sake, but it's to make room for other stuff. The bad stuff is obvious. There's, there's not many that would argue those things that Paul listed in Scripture, those things need to go, and if they haven't gone, we, we need to do whatever it takes to get rid of those things. They just need to go. We need to let go of that. But sometimes we have to let go of some not so obvious, okay stuff to make room for better stuff. The best stuff that God wants to grow in our lives. And he lists that here too. Did you get that list? These are things that God wants to grow in your life. Compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Putting up with each other, even forgiving each other. And above all of that stuff, putting on love. That's a pretty good list. As you make room and practice some of the spiritual disciplines to help you, you can focus on this list. Let me, let me give you an example of how to do this. This is my prayer. God, you know how angry he, she, or they make me. See, I intentionally didn't insert a name in there. I could have, and so could you. You know how angry they make me sometimes. Would you please give me a heart of compassion for them? Help me to see them through your eyes. I know I don't know the whole story or have any idea what it means to walk in their shoes. Would you give me just a glimpse so I can be your hands and your feet and your love to them? Here's another Father, I hate to admit it, but I'm guilty of slander. Ouch. I don't mean to. I, I, just, I just get caught up in the crowd. You know, there are some people who, who just have that way about them. And, and what they say even seems reasonable. But, I'm, but I see now that Satan even uses the reasonable arguments unreasonably. Make me kind and gentle and patient. Help me stand up for what is right, even if that means being the dissenting voice in the group. Cover me with your love and help me live it and breathe it and lavish it. I love that word on others. You see, that's what God does to, to us. He lavishes his love on us, his grace on us, his gifts on us. How often do we do that for others? Back to that grace thing. It is amazing how often, how desperately I need grace from God and from others and how unwilling I am to extend that grace to others. Just being honest. I, I imagine that we're all a little guilty of that time to time. And, but they irritate me so much. They know better. They shouldn't be doing that.
God, use me, help me. I want to give up so I can make room for compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and, and love. You see, when, when we talk about knowing something, it's an interesting thing. When we really know something, I mean really, when it really moves into the place that we know it, it demands something from us. I remember an episode from MASH. You guys all know what MASH is? It was one of these situations where the post op was full of patients and this pilot came in for some reason. And, and he was excited about his part in the war because all he had to do was, was sit up in the airplane and drop bombs on the enemy. Well, Hawkeye and Trapper, as they were wont to do, decided to give this guy a lesson. And so they took him into, into post-op to show him the result of his war effort. And half of them were children. And that knowledge changed him. And he was very angry with them because that knowledge demanded something different. The war was nice and clean when you're up at 10,000 feet dropping bombs. When you see the result of the bombs you drop. See, folks, that, that's the struggle. We can also, with, with this stupid social media, we can drop bombs all over people and never experience the result of it. God, forgive us. It's tough. I know the principle's the same. Now, now you have the knowledge. It's right here. It's, it's clear as the day with no room for compromise. The Holy Spirit is revealing it to some of our hearts today. What are you going to do about it? There's one more step. How do we know Jesus? How do we know Jesus? Everything is affected by the privilege of calling Jesus Christ our Savior, our Lord and friend. Let's not be knowledgeable about Jesus. Let's really know him. And there's a huge difference, right? I know a lot of people in the churches who know all about Jesus. They know his history. They know everything about it. They can quote exactly what they need to do, but don't. Well, how can we know him? Well, the most important way is to spend time with him. And you can know him and you can't know him apart from his word. Everything we know about Jesus, the way to know him is found in his word. As, as we dwell on his word and obey his commands, we will live as kingdom people. We will be light in this world to those who are still sitting in darkness. So what do we have to do to, to let go of so that we can spend time allowing him to speak to us? One of these disciplines that can help us is fasting from background noise. How often, I wonder, do most of us experience silence? That's a hard discipline, but it's a good one. If, if you have to have something going on all the time, activity, noise. If you turn on the radio as soon as you get home or in the car, you might be surprised at the soothing power of silence. <clears throat> I had an opportunity to go to Spokane on Thursday for a meeting, and I spent most of both drives, the radio off, in silence. Not all, but most of it. I took at least an hour both ways so that I could just listen to Holy Spirit speak. If you're in traffic, pray for the other drivers instead of worrying about what's on the radio. Spend time Practicing the presence of God. Really, it's a matter of making a, a, a space for him in your life to speak. For some, it might help to imagine Jesus in the seat beside you. I wonder how, if that would change how you drive. I doubt Jesus would be stamping a hole in the floorboard over there like my dad used to do. <laughs> yes, Dad, I know. I'll break. I'll break. 
From time to time, just remind yourself that God is with you. Soak up the feeling of God's presence, listening to his leading. You see, the, the goal is to know Jesus. I mean, really know him. I, I submit to you today that when you really know Jesus, i.e. have a personal relationship with him, a connection with him, that's the most important thing in your life, obedience will follow. You won't be able to help yourself. <laughs> And when you allow him to help you let go and, and make room for, your life will change. You will become a knowledgeable, obedient Christian. And I'm discovering that those are the kind of Christians that God uses to change the world. Just a few days, we begin the Easter journey, the Lenten journey. Hopefully, God's given you a little bit of knowledge today. Hopefully, Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and you're hearing what he has to say. The question is what you're going to do. What are you going to do about it? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you. For your word today. I've decided I am not going to be a knowledgeable, disobedient Christian. I refuse it. I understand there are times when I probably fail. But I am listening, I'm listening to your word, and I will allow you to help me in whatever way I need to let go so that I can make room for allowing you to work in my life in a new way. I know that people are difficult and, and life is a struggle sometimes and we go through stuff. And this is not about condemnation at all. This is only about listening to your Holy Spirit and allowing you to transform us into the image of your Son. Because God... You're really serious about this changing the world thing. Forgive us when we aren't. And I pray, Father, as we move forward into this time of Lent, the, the journey to Easter, that we would begin to get excited. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to begin to, to do whatever it takes into my life to, to help me be excited about that. This is the time to celebrate and worship. This is the heartbeat of Christianity, that Jesus is risen. This is it. This is the pinnacle. As important as Christmas is, that's only the beginning, but Easter is the finale. So, Father, I pray that you would work in us and use us to be your light. Help us not to squander this time to really connect and really become what you need us and want us to become for you. And Lord, if there's anyone who's struggling with, with some of the stuff that, that Paul mentioned in the scripture, Father, we just release that right now in Jesus' name. We ask you to forgive us. Sometimes it's hard to let go of that stuff on our own, but we need your help and we want to let go and we want to make room for that good stuff, the compassion and kindness and love. Make us like you, Jesus. Make us like you. And I pray that you would start today, even as we leave this place, as we move forward, give us your grace for everyone we meet so that we can represent you well. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Please stand and greet those around you. If you haven't seen Bert and Diane, our Bert and Deanna are busy with us today, so be sure to say hi to them. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>